Um, detective, detective uh, constable, and he's hunting down a serial killer. And at the same time, he's hunting down a religious cult. Conversations within the authors. Your book is called Double Fantasy. Correct. It's um, <laughs> it's part of a series. This is number four in the series. And Correct. you are the author of dark fiction that mm. uh, that strikes a chord. I, I am excited. So... Part four. This part four is already out. Then, right? Yeah, yeah, it's been out um, about six months or so. Um, so it's not a brand new release. I'm working on five and six of the uh, Judd Stone novel, amongst other things, novels rather, series, amongst other things. But yeah, it's been out about six months, um, and it's the fourth in the Judd Stone series. Yeah, so I can tell you all about it if you want, or unless you have any specific questions. That was actually going to be my question <laughs> for those people, for those that don't know. Can you just uh, give us like a brief overview of what this series is about? Yeah, sure. So Judd Stone. Um, he starts off in Mind Gorilla, which is book one, as a um, detective, detective uh, constable, and he's hunting down a serial killer. And at the same time, he's hunting down a religious cult. And quite a different connections happen and they and they join um, towards the end. So it becomes a sort of climatic experience at the end of the book. There's quite a lot of arcs going on, but um, it, it works, I'm glad to say. I'm, or I think it works. Um but what you find out very early on is that Judd is a quite an uncom uncompromising individual and he's quite well, it's a lovable rogue type thing, but he's an anti-hero and he probably breaks the law more times than um, the police do <laughs> or the people he's trying to catch do, I should say. It's definitely, he does. He breaks the law more than the police do. Um, but, <laughs> so he gets results, but he gets them in unorthodox ways. So... For the series to develop, I kind of um, moved him out of being a policeman to being a private detective so that um, he can play by his own rules a little bit more, um, which he does. <laughs> um, and by book four, Double Fantasy, he's actually been through um, the 27 Club trying to protect um, a pop star becoming a member of the 27 Club. So he became a bodyguard for a while to a 26-year-old pop star. Um, then he also uh, became private in investigator working on cold cases, et cetera, et cetera. And by book four, he he's done all this private investigating uh, stuff and he thought he was due a bit of a holiday. So his friend gives him a call, says, do you fancy a boozy weekend in Liverpool, England, um, home of the Beatles? And Judd, when you get to read about him, is a big, big uh, he's a big, big fan of the Beatles, so it, it's a bit of a no-brainer for him. He goes, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come along for a weekend. What he doesn't realise is, is to is to play the part of Andrew Ridgely, which is one part of Wham, um, with George Michael in a tribute act. So he, he's he's been hauled in um, to play in an '80s tribute festival. So there's a whole heap of acts of '80s stars. Uh, in inverted commas, because they're, they're tribute acts like someone's pretending to be Madonna, someone's pretending to be Coach Club, etc., etc. Anyway, that that all goes quite well. Then it gets a little bit out of hand when they uh, move on to um, to frequent the clubs of Liverpool as a bit of a celebration, and um, they get wound up with some gangsters um, in Liverpool. Um, which ends quite badly. Something happens um, where it ends quite badly and they get chased out of Liverpool into the countryside of Merseyside. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, his weekend away, which you thought was a holiday, is now turned quite uh, quite on its head. <laughs> and, he, and he has to get involved in, in again trying to um, work on something because when he escapes to the countryside in the middle of a, st of a terrible storm, he stumbles upon witchcraft and the occult and um, all, all that sort of stuff that happens or potentially can happen in the um, in in the countryside of of England uh, and other places as well, I guess. But yeah, so it goes on to a bit of a witchcraft story um, after that, and and um, he has to find a Satanist cult and and kind of try and stop them uh, wreaking havoc in the countryside. Oh wow! <laughs> you just <laughs> included everything in there. That's yeah. pretty awesome. Sorry, I, I, once I, once, I'm like I, once you wind me up, I just go. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, can you go back to the beginning? What sparked this whole series? To what sparked you to write it in the first place? 
Yeah, well, it's it's quite funny actually because um, back Mind Gorilla Book One, which I spoke about, where where is this uncompromising and very bad policeman, uh, good policeman but bad policeman at the same time? If that makes sense. He was meant to be the sidekick for another protagonist, uh, who is his friend and mentor, Detective Chief Inspector William Chamberlain. Now, what I wanted to do with that story was um, because with me writing dark fiction, I like to inject paranormal, supernatural, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot going on in Mind Gorilla. I've spoke about, um, you know, the um, the the cult that's in there and a serial killer, but um, also um, mind control is in there and um, the theory of programming assassins by brainwashing and all that kind of stuff. Um, but as a flip side to that, um, DCI Chamberlain, who I thought was the main protagonist, he actually has got multiple sclerosis. And as the multiple sclerosis um, affects him more and more um, with his physical disabilities and, and his uh, capabilities, um, his actual powers of telekinesis, so you remember Carrie, Stephen King, there was Carrie who could do all sorts of things with the mind. Well, he can as well. Um, but as his multiple sclerosis gets worse, his powers of telekinesis get stronger. Um, so... Even though he's his friend, DCI Chamberlain sends Judd on a bit of a wild goose chase um, to kind of bring in a debt for him, shall we say, because um, I don't want to give too many spoilers away. Um, so it was meant to just be a standalone, not a series, and uh, Judd was the sidekick of, of William. Um, as it turned out, I started to get some feedback, including uh, some very nice reviews um, that were written on, on various platforms. That I really like Judd Stone. I want to read more Judd Stone. I like Judd Stone. So it's like, oh my goodness, I, I better write a series about Judd Stone. And that's <laughs> how it developed. It was never the intention. Um, but I'm glad it was and it's worked it. You know, it's funny how life works out sometimes. And I'm glad it has because um it's quite fun to write now. Um and William does still appear up until book uh three. Um um, but um, it, he becomes more of a, a sidekick to Judd than than, than the, the original uh, thought process of what I was doing um, in that series. Well, now, Martin, so I have a question. Yeah. You are writing about witchcraft and, and like powers and stuff. How much personal experience in real life do you have with that kind of stuff? Yeah, so certainly not from a practicing point of view. I'm not a practicing <laughs> wizard or witchcraft or anything. And, you know, and I, I'm... I wouldn't say I'm cynical, but um, I, 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 I question sometimes when you hear about people talking about experiences and that, and I think, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, always keep an open mind. I've always been open to the idea of ghosts and aliens or and supernatural things, bums that go, things that go bump in the night and that. But then I did have an actual experience myself, which kind of, um, well, kind of proved to me these <laughs> these things can happen. Um, and what it was, I was uh, staying in the Peak District of England. And the funny thing was, I, and it's going to sound like I'm doing a PR stunt, but I, I swear I am not. Because I wrote a book, actually, about um, a rock star who stayed in a haunted house in in England, um, in the Peak District area of England, which is a beautiful part of England. It's got lots of mountains. Um, they get a bit of snow. <laughs> um, but it is really beautiful, really picturesque. Um, and it's part of the country that I really love personally but anyway I went and stayed in this place with my wife um in a village that I won't name um but it's in the Peak District and we got there and it was clearly a very old cottage and it was really really nice actually um it'd been modernized etc etc but there was one um there was one door that was locked and and it was in the center of the house of the cottage which was a little bit strange so it was like a protecting the room or, or or not allowing access to a room right in the middle of the cottage so we read the the history of the cottage um that was uh in the information pack and it said that um once upon a time going back centuries you know it has been standing for centuries this particular cottage although it's been really modernized the center of it there was a well um and people used to actually use that well for the village um to get money at, uh, to get money out the well that'd be nice <laughs> to get water from the well to feed the village but it was in the middle of the cottage which was really really strange um but then also uh in this cent central um part of the cottage it used to be used as a slaughterhouse um for animals etc cetera, etc cetera. 
Um, so clearly a lot of death had happened there. And, and you know, you, your mind starts wondering to, well, you know, in them days, there was no CCTV, et cetera, et cetera. I, I wonder if anything happened untoward in there with the humans as well as animals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, thought no more of it. Um, as I said, this was clearly locked, this door in the centre of the cottage. Um, when we got up each morning, there would be footprints, you'd see, sandy, muddy footprints walking away from the door. So this door's locked, but these footprints are walking away from the door. And the first time it happened, we thought, this is a bit curious, a bit strange. So, you know, we cleaned it up. Um, no one's got else has got access to the house. Um, and then we uh, we got up the next morning, same thing again, then footprints had appeared. Um, so it was like, wow, this is a bit weird now and a bit spooky. Don't really like this. What's going on? These footprints are appearing and they're coming away from a locked door. So, um, you know, that was that. Then um, the doors were in the house were all very old fashioned with the latches. Uh, and, you know, to lift the latch, it takes quite a bit of effort. You know, it's a, a wind couldn't blow the door or nothing. Um, and these latches used to lift up and open and then the door would come open in the night. Um, we'd have to get up and go and shut them down, et cetera, et cetera. But this one night, and I didn't tell my wife this until uh, after the holiday because I didn't want to frighten her. Um, I actually woke up and I was, and there was a figure standing at the beside my bed. And as I looked at it, it just kind of gradually faded away from top to bottom. And like that obviously freaked me out. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say nothing I kept it quiet and and you know the ironic thing is um, until, until it happens to you you think you, if you ever were in that position you would be terrified and it was scary in that but I never felt like I wanted to run out of the house and get away from there uh, you know what I mean I wanted to see my holiday trip <laughs> and I actually, actually had a really good time even though um, these scary things kind of happen so that that's that's a bit of a so yeah that happened to me um, for sure that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so you haven't had any experience with Satanism or anything? It was oh no 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 mm -hmm. no. I just I, I mean it, it's always a subject that's fat, fascinated me for at arm's length from afar. You know mm -hmm. what makes people want to um, explore that side of things. You know, um, so a, a, as a topic, it's always fascinated me. But it's definitely not something I want to get indulged with. I don't think I'd ever do a Ouija board, for example. Um, I'd just be too scared <laughs> to win <laughs> do that. <laughs> so, but so no, never been involved in nothing. But there's something about it that just fascinates me. The same with you know, I, I clearly never would be a serial killer, but there's something about you see them true crime programs and things, yeah. um, and the mind of the serial killer. Um, it, it's just a fascinating thing that that makes people want to do that. Obviously, it's terrible, and and it would be better if, if the world didn't have serial killers in it but there is something fascinating around the macabre and i don't know it's because it's so far removed from our own thought processes that, that makes it fascinating you know it's kind of that yin and yang thing potentially so mm -hmm. so you said uh book five and six are in the works right now yeah okay when yeah. can we expect to see those? When are those right, so I would I was hoping to get them out really, really, really quick, but there's a couple of projects that have got in the way, which are really good projects, but they're non-fiction projects. Um, where I'm right, you know, I you said at the beginning my sort of strap line is dark fiction that strikes a chord. Well, the chord bit is because music is involved with everything, chord, C H O R D, you know, it's the chord in music. So um, it strikes a chord because I think hopefully emotionally it connects with people. Um, but the, it, it's a play on words because music is so ingrained in everything I do. I spoke about a rock, rock star, wrote a book about a rock star who born to haunted house, etc. Um, so these non fiction projects that I'm, um, I'm working with um, a lady called Maggie Demond who uh, was a singer in the 80s. She was in a band called Scarlet Fantastic. And her brother took lots and lots of photos before he sadly passed away of very, very early Duran Duran. Um, so we're compiling them photos into a book series um, for the world to see because they, they were captured at a time when Duran Duran weren't even famous. So it's really, really um, sort of um, great that he captured that embryonic process of Duran Duran mm -hmm. stepping from the transition from 
just being a Birmingham band to where I'm from, to being like global megastars. And then another one I'm working on is um, a uh, again an '80s band that were big in the UK. I don't think they were so big in America, but big in the UK. Um, the only all girl band actually of the UK to have an indie number one uh, who played their all all their own instruments. So I'm helping them with their biography. So these two projects have now um, uh, uh, took took priority. However. Um, I have started books five and six, which was ambitious anyway to do two <laughs> two books together. Um, but I kind of got the ideas together. So, um, and in book five, which has got a work inside sort of when the levy breaks, Judd, um, he explores actually something that I read around um, a Mexican myth or legend, because I like to bring legends into, you know, I like to do a bit of faction and bring a few legends in and, and um, stories and folklore and that that, that, that people are, are quite uh, au fait with. And there's one in Mexico that really intrigued me, um, where a Mexican girl potentially haunts a lake. Um, and they, they have got an island, I can't remember exactly what it's called, um, but people put dolls up all around the island um, to try and appease the spirit of the of the girl. Um, so that sort of concept, I haven't quite thought it through how it's going to go or where it's going to finish, but I've brought that to um, a place called Sutton Park in Birmingham um, where there's lots of lakes and, and there is going to be a mystery around a girl that um, potentially drowned, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's book five. Um Book six is about the black market of organ trafficking. So um, Judd will try and have to crack why or try and stop it happening. Um, you know, organs on the black market, like kidneys being sold on the black market, taken from people, et cetera, et cetera. People potentially killed for their organs to feed. Um, what's the perception of a higher class system? Um, you know, so... He's going to explore all that, the black market, which I know is, I've got to research that a bit more, but I know it's a real thing. It's a worrying thing. We used to have an urban legend, I don't know if you had it in America, we used to have an urban legend um, where people used to, say, that used to hear that people had woke up in the bath in a, bu in a, in mm -hmm. a bath of ice because someone had stole their kidney after spiking a drink, that kind of thing. So um, but I, I believe, well that, although that's an urban legend, there is a real market that's a lot more sinister for organ trafficking, unfortunately. So that's what Judd's going to be up to in book six. Wow. <laughs> you right. are exciting. That is awesome. What, so what was the name of the girl band that you were talking about? Uh, they were initially called We've Got a Fuzz Box and We're Going to Use It, which is a bit of a mouthful. So they just shortened it to Fuzz Box. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were, they were, they had a few hits in the eighties. Um, best selling album. Uh, they're from Birmingham as well. That's why I'm working with them. Um, they did they did get into the States and they were on a record company uh, with Geffen Records um, okay. in the States. They've done a cover of Yoko Ono's Walking on Thin Ice. Um, but um, I don't think they actually cracked the States, so to speak. Um, but they're out there on the internet if people want to go and look at them and that. But I, I'm I'm grateful and right, working with them to write their biography. It's a really good tale, actually. Of course, what it does, it, it really puts a spotlight on. Um, although these girls were quite ballsy, <laughs> for want of a better way, um, you know, the pressures of the music industry um, at that time in particular with an all girl band and, you know, it's quite male dominated and all that. So there's quite a few stories to tell underneath all the musical stuff, you know what I mean? So it's actually quite a good story and works a little bit like a guide, if you like, for any any females looking to go into the pop industry now. So it's quite powerful. It's, it's, it's getting good. There's that lots of fun in it as well. There's lots of fun parts in it as well. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So do you have a YouTube where all of this is going to be posted or how can we follow along so we know what project you have? Because you have a lot yeah. of really great ones. Yeah, so clearly I should have a YouTube. So uh, <laughs> I'll need to get onto that. I've got a website, uh, www.martintracy.co.uk. Um You'll see everything posted on my socials, um, which on Facebook, uh, Twitter, uh, or X as it's called now, isn't it? Um, threads, Twitter. I need to get a bit more better with TikTok as well as YouTube. Um, but you know that 
there's Fuzzbox official sites as well that push it, the information out as well. Um, but you know, you'll be, you'll definitely be able to track it through uh, my website and, and my my socials, um, which is just Martin Tracy author. You know, you'll find me. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm on all the platforms. Although I need to engage with a few a bit more, a bit better than I do than others. Um, <laughs> I understand that. I mean, when <laughs> when when the when the projects are finished, there'll be, there'll be a bona fide sort of marketing campaigns and media campaigns, and that will push stuff out. You know, including YouTube, we, we will maximize YouTube. Absolutely. Um, yeah. That's awesome. You have so many cool things that you do. Do you play an <laughs> instrument too? I do. Yeah. Um. I play keyboard. Um. I've still got the upright piano. Um. That my mum inherited when she was a cleaner. Bless her. In um. She cleaned a, a house. So we were from quite humble beginnings, um, and she, and she cleaned a house, and and the lady, uh, gave her their piano because I didn't want it anymore, and that's without that really I wouldn't have learnt to play the piano, at, and then progressed to keyboard playing and and all that kind of stuff. And before I uh, started to write books, I did play music and write songs, um, and uh, it was kind of. Fairly successful, not not you. You won't have heard me. You won't. You won't. You won't have heard. I didn't break the states. Let's put it that way. But you know, I did some good stuff. I I supported a band called the Fine Young Cannibals, which were oh, quite yeah. in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, and Roland Gift. So they, that was a, that was a good thing to do, and um, I did get to write a song that appeared on a uh, CD of Wolverhampton Wanderers Football Club. So um soccer you would know it as so mm -hmm. we're very passionate about our soccer in england my team is wolverhampton wanderers which is just down the road from birmingham and i actually managed to write a song and sign a record contract and that got put on a compilation cd of lots of songs about the team and our nickname is walls which is quite cool um you know because walls you know so wolverhampton walls so <laughs> <laughs> i've done lots of Crazy things, Brittany. <laughs> you know what? That's exactly how I like to live. I think that everyone should do you need, you need to follow your creative passions. I think that's yeah. beautiful. I have a lot of crazy like I have other YouTube channels and I'll just like I'll put up like I get these ideas and I'm like, okay, I'll just create it. I don't know however yeah. bad it might be. <laughs> I'll just <laughs> I started writing a book and then I had songs for it. And I'm like, I don't get it, but okay. <laughs> like, I, like that. I like that. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's awesome that that is like definitely after my own heart I love that just I think that's what our life should be filled with because that yeah feels amazing to allow your creativity out and actually fulfill it and then see like oh my gosh <laughs> that's pretty cool yeah. like look what I did that's amazing yeah. so I appreciate exactly. it I want you to let me know when the next books are coming out so you can come back oh. on and let us know and we can oh, talk well, about it again. I'll let you know when uh both the if you'll have me the non-music so sorry, the non-fiction books, the musical projects I spoke about. So I could definitely get back to you again. And then uh, I'll come back again when books five and six are out for Judd as well. And anything Perfect. else that I can, I can talk to you about if you're willing to have me. Always happy to have a chat, Brittany, especially with people um, across the pond, so to speak. I like to connect with America. Uh, That's so awesome. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. I can't wait for to hear about, like these musical projects. That's That's right up my alley. I love it. Cool. I will definitely be in touch again then. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> the Zarlaquan Indieverse.